This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University. And today I wanted to do part one of what's going to be a two part series. I'm calling this using the Lightning Network with the Phoenix Wallet. The Lightning Network works in a very particular way. And if you don't understand how it works when you first use the Phoenix Wallet, you're going to be very confused. So in this video, I wanted to do background in terms of how the Lightning Network works, how Lightning nodes work and payment channels and liquidity management, channel balancing, this sort of thing. And then in the next part, we will do a more in-depth dive with the Phoenix Wallet app itself. So the Lightning Network to begin there, it's a layer two solution built on top of Bitcoin's base layer. Lightning itself, it's an open protocol that can be used by anyone. Lightning is not controlled by any corporation. It's not controlled by Lightning Labs even though people like the Hex and the XRP people seem to not understand this. The Lightning Network itself is a network of payment channels. So we have the base layer, we have on-chain, we have layer one. This is the Bitcoin blockchain. On the right side are blocks that have already been mined. On the left side are blocks that are waiting to be mined. So this is on-chain or layer one. Layer two, an example of a layer two is the Lightning Network, which is a series of payment channels that are connected all around the world. We can see here North America, Europe, Asia, etc. So the Lightning Network, it's a network of payment channels. A very simple example of a payment channel would be you could have a channel between Paul and Peter and they send money back and forth to each other. The Lightning Network, especially when you're within a channel, is essentially free to send money back and forth. You could have another channel with Peter and Mary. So Paul can send to Peter, Peter can send to Mary. In order to have a payment channel like this, both sides, so both Paul and Peter, or both Peter and Mary, would need to be running Lightning nodes and to be online to receive payments. Now, the nice thing is when you have a network of payment channels, you can route payments across that network through the different payment channels. So for example, Paul can send Bitcoin to Mary via Peter. He sends it from Paul to Peter and then Peter to Mary. To set up a channel, you and your channel partner, so maybe you're Paul and Peter, you and your channel partner lock up Bitcoin on chain on the base layer in a two of two multi-sig. You lock up Bitcoin on chain in order to be able to use that Bitcoin on the Lightning Network. So no extra Bitcoin is created. It's simply locked up on chain while you're using it on the Lightning Network. So that 21 million maximum supply is still enforced. And at any time you can close your payment channel and get your Bitcoin back on chain delivered to a Bitcoin address on chain. And if your payment channel partner tries to cheat you, there's also a way that the payment channel will be automatically closed and you'll get all of the money that's in the channel. So this is an incentive for your partner not to try to cheat you in the, in the payment channel. Here's some activities on the Lightning Network that require an on-chain transaction fee. In other words, a Bitcoin transaction fee at the base layer, opening a payment channel, opening a Lightning payment channel, closing a lightning payment channel. Each of these are two of two multi-sig transactions on the base layer, adding funds to a payment channel. In other words, what's called splicing in, which is a relatively recent invention. Also removing funds from a payment channel, bringing them back on chain. That would be called splicing out. So you have splicing in, splicing out, which is a way of making a channel bigger or making a channel smaller, as we're going to see. So the Lightning Network, because all of these activities require an on-chain transaction fee, the Lightning Network is not immune to high on-chain transaction fees, but it is a very clever way of batching up lots of transactions and then settling the net result of those transactions on-chain at a later point in time. So for example, Peter and Mary could send money back and forth. And then at some point, maybe they no longer have a business relationship. One of them's a grocery store. One of them is the person who shops at the grocery store, for example. And when they're done using the payment channel, they can close it and get the net result on chain of all the money, all the Bitcoin that's been sent back and forth. So the Lightning Network, it's not immune to high on-chain transaction fees, but it's a clever way of batching up transactions and then settling the net result on chain. And this is how money works. Money always scales in layers. And anyone who tries to do everything at the base layer, for example, as Ethereum, Ethereum tries to do way too much at the base layer. This is a very foolish way to construct things. Money always scales in layers. And if you want to go a little bit deeper in that, how that worked under a gold standard, a fiat standard, and the Bitcoin standard, I will link to this video in the description notes below. And I'll just ask you at this point, if you're finding this video helpful, please help to support the channel by subscribing. That's the most important thing you can do. Liking this video, leaving a comment, question, suggestion for a future topic. Also sharing this video with a family member or a friend.
Now, in order to send sats, satoshis, or Bitcoin across the Lightning Network, your payment will be automatically routed from payment channel to payment channel. Remember what this looks like, all these interconnecting channels. And if a path cannot be found across the world or to whomever you're sending the money, if a path cannot be found, your payment will fail and the funds will be returned to your Lightning wallet. So not every payment channel is connected to every other payment channel. This is a very loose open permissionless network. So for example, I could set up a payment channel with you and we could send Bitcoin back and forth all day long, no permission required, but that doesn't mean that we're gonna be able to get Cash App or Strike or another big corp corporation to open a Lightning payment channel directly with one of us. So think the way this is developing, it's a little bit like the hub and spoke model, like major airports where you have major lightning nodes, for example, the ones run by Cash App or Strike, and then you have all the different spokes coming out of the hub. Large lightning nodes run by regulated companies will not connect to lightning nodes run by just anyone like you or me usually. Nevertheless, Lightning is still permissionless. So I can set up a payment channel with you. We can send money back and forth all day long. We can send it across the network as well as long as we're connected. And we may be able to route around Cash App or route around Strike if we need to. So in practice, there are actually, you can think of it in this way, there are actually many different Lightning networks. There's a more corporate KYC custodial version, and there's also more sovereign non-KYC where you don't have to give up personal information, self-custodial version. And this is more like the Phoenix wallet, which we're gonna be learning how to use today and in tomorrow's video. So again, the Lightning Network is just a network of payment channels, not all of which connect to each other. One major use case that's developing is that large corporations like payment apps, like Cash App and Strike, exchanges like Binance and Coinbase, sending Bitcoin back and forth to each other, thus freeing up and causing less congestion on the base layer, on the Bitcoin blockchain itself. Another major use case is gonna be more self-sovereign payments as we're gonna learn how to do with the Phoenix wallet. But first, some more necessary terminology. Custodial wallets, custodial wallets are wallets where your money is held by a custodian, held by a third party, and you need to ask pretty please to move your Bitcoin. They might just decide to keep your Bitcoin or they might lose your Bitcoin, they might get hacked, etc. They might lose the private keys, for example. So that's custodial wallets where you have a third party custodian. And then we have self-custodial wallets and non-custodial wallets. This is pretty much the same, a way of saying the same thing. You don't have a third party custodian, you are the custodian. In other words, you own what you own. This is sort of ridiculous government uh, regulatory language calling something self-custodial or non-custodial. For example, I don't say my car is self-custodial. I own my car, I own my bed, I own my phone, etc. So self-custodial wallets, non-custodial wallets, you control your own Bitcoin and you don't need to ask permission to send it or to spend it. So that's the distinction between custodial and self-custodial, non-custodial wallets. The Phoenix wallet obviously is a self-custodial, non-custodial wallet. Now to practice self-custody with Bitcoin on-chain, you just need a Bitcoin software wallet or hardware wallet and your 12 or 24 word backup. You don't actually need to run a Bitcoin node, though you should run a Bitcoin node so you can make sure that you can interact directly with the Bitcoin network and broadcast and send and receive your own transactions without needing to trust someone else's node. So for example, when you're using Trezor Suite, you're trusting Trezor's node, but you don't need to run a node to practice self-custody with Bitcoin on-chain, even though it is a best practice to run a node. By contrast, to practice self-custody with Bitcoin, not on the base layer, not on-chain, but with Bitcoin on the Lightning Network, you must run your own node, in this case, your own Lightning node. The easy non-sovereign version of, of the Lightning Network is using a custodial wallet, as we've discussed, something like Wallet of Satoshi, for example. Strike is another example of a custodial wallet. These wallets work flawlessly, but they're not self-sovereign. Custodial wallets can steal your Bitcoin. They can force you to provide personal information in order to withdraw what's called shotgun KYC, where you're able to use the wallet. And then when you want to, when you want to pull your money out, all of a sudden they ask for personal information. This is a rather sinister way of doing KYC. Or a custodial wallet can simply be forced out of your country as Wallet of Satoshi has been forced out of the US by the US government, which doesn't want us to have nice things. Though this can also be seen as a blessing because it's gonna push more people into self-custodial solutions like the Phoenix wallet. So to practice self-custody with Bitcoin on the Lightning Network, you need to run your own Lightning node. And at this point you might be saying, but wait, I don't know how to run a Lightning node. 
I don't know how either. Don't worry, says Phoenix Wallet. Just download our app and we'll spin up a fresh lightning node on your phone, on your smartphone. I think this is an unbelievably cool new innovation. It's really going to help self-custody when it comes to lightning. I believe this innovation running a lightning node on a phone on a mobile device was invented by Breeze. So this solves problem number one, how to run your own lightning node in order to have self-custodial, a self-custodial lightning solution. Problem number two for lightning is channel management and especially inbound liquidity. This is a little bit more complicated, so we will be talking about it today and tomorrow. And don't worry if it doesn't click for you the first time, you have to sort of listen to this a few times and it'll eventually make sense. And once you get it, it's very, very clear, but there is a little bit of a learning curve. So problem number two is there needs to be Bitcoin on the other side of the payment channel in order to have it sent to my side of the payment channel. So for example, if we have Robert and Alice here in a payment channel, Robert has 10,000 sats on his side of the channel. Alice has 5,000 sats on her side of the channel. In this example, Robert can send a maximum of 10,000 sats to Alice and Alice can send a maximum of 5,000 sats to Robert. And if someone, for example, is trying to send 20,000 sats from themselves to Robert through Robert to Alice, they won't be able to do it because Robert only has 10,000 sats on his side of the channel. You can think of this a little bit like a horizontal uh, hourglass, which doesn't make a huge amount of sense, but this could be the left side could be one side of the payment channel. The right side could be the other side of the payment channel. And if you have money coming in from this other direction, let's say that you are right here and there's money coming in through the channel, you are only able to receive as much as is on this side of the payment channel. So if someone else is trying to send you, uh, send you some Satoshis, you can only receive as much as it can be sent over to you from this side of the channel. You could also think of it in terms of like a one row abacus where uh, I like the sand example more because it's, it's non-discrete units, but you could think of it as this way as well. So when you see this map of the Lightning Network, each of these channels has a certain amount of liquidity on each side of it. And we're going to be looking in depth how Phoenix does this. So you can download the Phoenix wallet app, native lightning support, non-custodial, get it on Google Play or download in the App Store. This is a free uh, mobile lightning wallet. It's open source, so you can verify that there's no funny business going on. It's a mobile wallet, as we said, for your phone. And most importantly, it's self-custodial or non-custodial. And you can also use it in a non-KYC manner, which is really cool. So in conclusion, to use Lightning in a self-custodial manner, you need to be running a Lightning node, and you also need to be doing channel management, especially managing inbound liquidity. And fortunately, the Phoenix Wallet is a mobile solution that can take care of both of these things for you. And we're going to be going into this in depth in tomorrow's video. So be sure to stay tuned for tomorrow's video. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.